All right. Welcome to our second and last lecture uh, for our financial literacy unit. Uh, for this lecture, we're going to cover three different things. First, so last week we talked about the importance of investing, why you need to do that. Um, now we're going to talk about where do you actually put that money. Um, and then we're going to talk about credit and credit cards. And then finally, student loans. So those three things. Um, so let's quickly review our rules. So we're going to have nine rules uh, for this unit. And my hope is that you are, uh, hopefully you have some sort of index card or something uh, comparable to that and uh, write down these rules. And my hope is that, um, although you may not see the importance of it right now, that later on uh, you can take out those rules and uh, they may help you. So rule number one, save at least 20% of your money after tax money. So after the government takes out their money, save 20%. Have an emergency fund to last uh, three to six months. So if you lose your job, uh, you have enough money so you can live for three to six months. Uh, number three, invest in low cost index funds. So this is kind of hinting at where we are going. Um, we'll, we'll talk about now where, what kind of accounts uh, do you create to buy these index funds and, uh, Vanguard, the company I go through again, there's other companies, Fidelity, um, you know, uh, JP Morgan, Chase, whatever. And there's lots of different companies. Um, uh, so we buy these index funds. These are groups of stocks. They're less volatile than buying individual stocks. Uh, and then number four is, uh, you know, <clears throat> when can I stop working? Well, once you save 25 times your yearly spending, so whatever you need to live off of, uh, for a year, um, save 25 times that, and then you can quit working regardless of your age. All right. So rule number five, rule number five. So we're talking about where do we actually put this money? So when we're going to buy these index funds, what sort of account or accounts do I need? Um, and, uh, the government has created these various tools. Um, and it all has to do with taxes. So they've, they've created these various, um, kind of types of accounts that you can create, um, to help you save your money. Um, and so the first one you've probably seen or heard the term a 401k. Um, and so this rule says save in a 401k, which is just the section of the tax code. That's where it gets its name from. So save in a 401k or the equivalent. So if you work for a government agency like I do, uh, it'll be a little bit different. It might be like a 403b, but they're essentially the same thing. So save in a 401k or the equivalent up to the employer match. So some employers, when you get your job, they will match whatever you put in your 401k up to a certain percentage. So, you know, <clears throat> my employer doesn't do this, so I'm not, I'm not sure what a common percentage is, but my guess is, I don't know, 10% maybe. So if you put in 10% of your paycheck, your employer will match you 10%. Okay. So you always want to take that match. You, you want to, even though it's going to be hard on your paycheck at first, you want to take that full match because that is free money. That's going to be the best returns, uh, some of the best returns that you will ever get. So after you've uh, done that, so they take money out of your paycheck, they put it in your 401k. We'll talk about exactly what a 401, why they are, uh, why they're good. Um, but they, they put it in the 401k. Uh, so after that, I would recommend maxing out a Roth IRA. An IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account. So there's really two types of IRAs. These are ones that you will create on your own. So 401k is actually offered or the equivalent is actually offered by your employer. So when you get your new fancy job, they will have you sign up for 
this. You're either 401k or 403b. Um, the IRA is something that you do on your own. So you can do that through Vanguard, uh, which is what I do. Uh, so this is not connected to your employer. So you have a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA. We're going to talk about the differences. In general, a good rule of thumb is that if you, um, if you think you're going to make more money in retirement, so when you retire, are you going to make more money than you are now? Uh, you'll want to do a Roth. If you think if you think you're actually going to have less money, so if you're going to be a very high uh, earner, um, which is awesome, uh, then a traditional IRA might actually be better. So it depends on really where where you see your your salary being, and I'll show you uh, some more details when we get there. And then I would recommend that these it comes right out of your paycheck, so you you automate it, so that way you don't even miss it. You get used to not seeing that money. All right, so um, again, these accounts, traditional IRA, Roth IRA, 401k, 403b, it gets confusing. Uh, it all has to do with taxes. And the government um, has created these for us to encourage us to save. So um, a traditional IRA is taxed um, pretty much the same as a 401k or a 403b. So 403b is just a government uh, equivalent of 401k. So if you work for a state or a federal government, you might have a 403b, um, but the taxes are the same. So you see uh, the arrows in the circle there, the, the red arrows mean, that that means it's, it's being taxed. So a traditional IRA or a 401k um, the money comes out of your out of your paycheck with untaxed dollars. So the government they don't take the income tax out of that. They don't take any taxes out of it. It goes straight into your 401k or traditional IRA. And then the circle shows the growth. So over time, as you buy these index funds in your 401k or traditional IRA, it's going to grow tax free. So all the money when your when your index fund is is going up. When the value is going up, you don't have to pay taxes on that. You only pay taxes on it when you take that money out. And you, you're going to take that money out when you retire. And then you pay taxes on it. Okay, so it's only taxed one time. Um, but there are some rules. You can only contribute $6,000 a year, which is $500 a month. Um, and that's per person. So if you're married, that would be double that. Um, but you can't take out the money until you're 59 and a half years old. So that that's kind of the big thing with it. So um, if you're planning on retiring early before that, which most people aren't, but uh, I myself am, then there, there's some restrictions. And then, you know, there's some some ways around this. And but that's uh, uh, more, you know, as you get into this, you can research some of that stuff. But um, you can't withdraw the money until you're 59 and a half. But then once you withdraw, it's going to be taxed. Now, a Roth IRA is a little bit different. So it's taxed uh, at the beginning. So you see the red arrows at the beginning. So it's funded with af after tax dollars. So you get your paycheck, the government takes out money, and then the money goes into your Roth IRA account. So it's already been taxed. And then it grows, the, the circle there, it grows tax-free. So every year, you know, you're making all that money. It's growing tax-free. Um, and then uh, you withdraw it tax-free as well. So once you withdraw it later on when you're 59 and a half, you don't have to pay taxes on that either. So you pay it at the beginning. Now, it's the same contribution limit, $6,000, 500 bucks a month. Um, the, a slight difference, though, between this and a traditional IRA is the, your contributions you can withdraw at any time. So that $500 a month that you put in, you can take that out at any time, regardless of your age. But your earnings, so the, the money you make off of you know the, the growth of your index funds, that you can't take till you're 59 and a half. At the beginning, when you start investing, your contributions will be more than your earnings. Okay. But as you get older, you know, 20 years down the road, your earnings will actually be more than your contributions. So 
if you have a million dollars in your Roth IRA account, you know, $200,000 of that may be contributions. The other 800,000 uh, will be earnings. You know, that's just a rough estimate. That's just based on uh, compound interest. Um, but those uh, contributions you can, you can take out at any time. So if you retire early, maybe you retire at 55 and then you just take your contributions out tax-free uh, for four year, four and a half years till you turn 59 and a half. And then you take out your, your earnings again, tax-free. Now, if you take it out before 59 and a half, there is a penalty. I think it's 10% that you got to pay. So what do I choose? Traditional IRA, or Roth IRA. Again, a lot of it depends on your tax bracket or your tax rate, where you see yourself. So if, uh, I'll, sh I'll put up the, uh, the graph there. So most young workers, you're probably going to make less money. And, and when you get older, you're going to make more money. Um, and so you see most of you, when you, you know, get your first job, you'll probably be in that 12% tax bracket. And so a Roth is probably better for you because that money is being taxed at 12%. Now, um, later on, you know, once you make more money, you're going to be in a higher tax bracket. But when you withdraw your Roth IRA, you don't have to pay taxes on it again. You've already done it. So if you see yourself moving up into a higher tax bracket later on, a Roth is better. Now, if you think you're going to start in a high tax bracket, maybe you're going to be in the 24%. Um, maybe a traditional IRA will be better for you. So it all depends on, on where you think you're going to be. Um, so I personally do um, uh, my government 403B and I do a Roth. I max that out. Um, then there's, there's kind of a third uh, account uh, a taxable or a brokerage account. Now this, uh, you see the red there where it's taxed. This is taxed more There's because there's no restrictions. You can take this money out at, at any time. Um, so this is really what you would get if you're into like buying stocks, buying and selling stocks all the time and you want to make money immediately, you would get a taxable account. And for me, I do this all through Vanguard so I can make a Roth in Vanguard. I can make a taxable account in Vanguard. Um, and then I have my work one that's separate. Um, sometimes your work one could be through Vanguard as well if they, if they work with Vanguard or whatever company. Um, <clears throat> So a taxable account, it's you buy those index funds or, or, or straight up stocks if you really want to with after, after taxed money. Now, as that money grows, it may be taxed or I should say it's taxed when you sell. So maybe you're 30 and you buy a bunch of stocks and then 10 years later, you're going to sell at 40 years old. Then you will pay tax on that. But. Um, the tax you pay is not your income tax rate. So if you look, you know, back at the, at the graph I showed you, it's not going to be taxed at that rate. It's going to be taxed at the capital gains rate, which you can see here in the bottom right corner. So if your income is under, this is for married. Now, if you're single, it's going to be even less than this, but if your income is under $78,000, um, Sorry, my daughter just came out of bed. She's supposed to be sleeping. Um, so anyways, you're only going to pay tax on it if your income is under $78,000 for married, um, which a lot of people are over that. Now, if you're over that, it's going to be at 15%. So um, if your income is actually under $78,000 and you're married, this isn't really very different than a Roth IRA. Plus, it doesn't have any of those restrictions of a Roth IRA. So a taxable account could be part of what you do. So I personally, I have my government account, uh, my version of a 401k. I have a Roth IRA, but I also have a taxable account. And they all, you know, I contribute to all of them kind of for various reasons because there's, you know, um, certain benefits that each have. Okay, so that's kind of a quick overview and you can do more research on that later if you wanted to. So let's get into rule number six. So rule number six is to pay your credit card balance in full every month. Uh, you never want to run a balance on that credit card because the interest rates are so high. 
you know, the interest rates are a lot of times they average between 13, 14, 15 percent. Um, so you want to pay it off um, in full every month. So we're going to talk about credit. We're going to talk about credit cards and um, kind of the importance of credit, but also things to be aware of and to maybe stay away from. So a little history of, of uh, credit and credit cards. So essentially with credit or credit cards, you are being loaned the money. Um, and it's called a revolving credit because you can continually you know, pay it down and reuse it. So if you have a thousand dollar credit card, you can max it out, pay it down, spend another thousand and do that for, you know, till you die. So it's a revolving credit versus like you pay off the loan and then the, then the, the loan is closed. So um, the first widely accepted like plastic card that they used was 1958, an American Express card. Um, the first card that they allowed balances to be paid over time because the American Express card, you had to pay it off every month. You weren't allowed to actually carry a balance. The first one that you could carry a balance was the Bank America card, uh, which changed to uh, Visa. Now some uh, statistics here. The average credit card debt per U.S. adult with a credit card is $5,673. That's a lot of money. Total credit cards in circulation, $374 million. That's more people than there are uh, in the United States. That means people have multiple cards. I think the average is like three point something. So there's 374 million different credit card accounts. The average APR, at, as far as this May 2018, 16.73%, and my guess is that hasn't changed all that much. And the total debt has finally surpassed $1 trillion uh, in April of 2019. Um, so if you added up all of our credit card debt, um, over a trillion dollars, that's a lot of money. Um, the amount of low and middle income households that use credit cards to pay for their basic living expenses is 40%. That's not good. Um, so you're actually spending more money than you are making, and that is a problem. So, but credit cards um, uh, can serve a, a purpose, um, and I don't necessarily agree with how this works, but it is how it works. So that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, is <clears throat> you get a credit score, and credit scores are important, and they can save you lots of money uh, when you, especially when you want to buy a house. Uh, or maybe a car, uh, which I don't recommend financing a car. Um, but if you choose to, your credit score will matter. So basically your credit score, which is a FICO score, the Fa Fair Isaac Corporation created this uh, score basically to represent your credit worthiness. It, it's basically the likelihood that you will pay back your debt. So the higher, higher the number, the more likely you will pay it back. And it's actually pretty accurate and uh you know um i know people with a low credit score some friends and stuff i'm like yeah it makes sense why your credit score is so low i wouldn't even loan you money so these people aren't very trustworthy um uh, paying people back um people that do pay their debts back they have uh, higher credit scores and people will then loan you more money because you are responsible and you pay it back so uh, basically, there are three credit reporting agencies. These are three companies that um, you, you know, like when you uh, buy a house, they may they may check all three of these. They may only check one, but you can actually go to Equifax, Experian, uh, TransUnion, and you can pay for your credit report, um, and they will give you your score. Uh, what I've seen lately is is banks and credit cards will actually tell you your score. So now SDCU will just, every time I log in, it'll actually have my score up there. Um, so there's really no reason now to order it from these companies. But you can get it, uh, your credit report from the federal government. It's a, it's a law. It's called I think it's annualcreditreport.com. You can get your free uh, credit report once a year. And so a good... FICO score is, or no, not a good one. A FICO score is between 300 and 850. A good one is over 700. I would say even over 750 uh, is, you know, close to 800 is what you want to kind of shoot for um, because then you're going to get the best rate 
on your loan. So how do I get my credit score up? How do I work on that? Uh, here is uh, what makes up your, your credit score. Um, the amount that you owe on it is 30% of your score. So basically you want to keep the amount that you owe, um, you know, low. So if you have a thousand dollar limit, you really don't want to go over $300. You want to keep it under that. Really, you want to pay it off each month. Uh, but if you have a thousand dollar limit and you're constantly at like $999, that's your balance. It looks like you, uh, don't have your, um, economic life together. Um, so if you're constantly running up, uh, that, that, to that credit limit, um, it doesn't look like you're stable. And so you want to keep it low. It makes it look like you're more reliable, more trustworthy. Um, you can see the other uh, percentages, the length, you know, if you keep it a long time, that's why really you don't want to open a card, close it, open a new one, close it. Um, because it can hurt your, your credit score a little bit. Now, some people do it like if they're trying to get airline miles, they'll get a card and then they'll get the points and then close it. And so that can affect your score. But for some people, you know, 15% 15, 15 hit is worth it to get all those airline miles. I personally don't, don't do that. Um, so, and you make sure you make your payments on time. You don't want to miss a single payment. Again, you want to pay it off every month. But if you don't, you want to make sure you definitely pay it off um, or the minimum payment at least, uh, every month or else you will get dinged bad. Um, so that's what goes into your score. So why is it important? Uh, really, if you want to buy a house, which ultimately, you know, most of you probably will want to buy a house. That's the most important reason why you need a good credit score. I, I've known a lot of people when they were younger, just, they don't care. They'll take out credit card, buy a bunch of stuff, won't pay the money back. And they're credit score is just horrendous. And then later on they regret it because they're like, oh, now I kind of want to buy a house. I want to do this. I want to get a car. And they can't, they can't get approved because of their credit score. Um, so it's important to, uh, um, you know, uh, keep your, uh, finances, uh, stable. Um, you know, sometimes when you rent a house, they may check your, or they do usually check your, uh, credit score. Um, I've even heard of employers. Now I think some states are actually making that illegal for jobs. Actually check your credit. Um, but one of the most common reasons for people to have low credit scores, actually uh, medical debt. Um, and so you also want to pay that, you know, if you have medical debt, don't just ignore it, call them up, get a payment plan going, something like that. Um, because you don't want to default on that. It'll really hurt your, your credit score. So that's just a quick overview of credit and credit cards. Um, they, they even, they do make credit cards for like beginners, people that are, that are, uh, young, um, kind of starter ones. So there are those out there and you can, you know, Google, Google those and see the best ones, uh, to kind of start that, that process. But I think you gotta be 18, uh, to do that. So, uh, we're on to rule number seven which is we're talking about student loans. Rule number seven, keep student loan debt to a minimum. You want to have as, as little as possible, obviously. Kind of a general rule of thumb is don't take out more than what you think you will make uh, for your annual salary. Uh, so for instance, you know, if you think you're going to make $50,000 a year at, you know, in your first year at your, at your career job, don't take out more than $50,000 in student loans. Again, I would try to keep it way lower than that, you know, under $20,000 or, or zero, uh, is even better. Um, but if you're only going to be making 40 to $50,000 in your job, when you graduate college, you don't want to have $150,000 in student loan debt. That's just silly. So, um, in general though, you want to get these student loans, um, you, you want to have a government backed student loan. So you can get a private one by going to a bank. I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, you, you can get your student loans by filling out a FAFSA. So even if you don't, um, uh, qualify for financial aid, so for free money for grants, and that's also how you access student loans. So it's important to, to, to fill it out and just see where you're at and they will offer you uh, money usually, and you don't have to take it all. So it looks 
fun and it looks cool like oh i'm getting all this money um but you got to pay it back now when you pay it back um the important reason to have a government backed one is there are certain government programs that will help you with repayment and there's even politicians talking about forgiving all student loan debt i doubt that'll happen anytime soon but you never know it could um, so there's different programs and and these are the repayment plans right here these are the most recent ones these are always subject to, to change based on who's in office so uh, these were updated by obama and so who knows what will happen um, but the standard repayment plan is they take your loan and essentially divide it into 10 years and you pay monthly on that. It might be four or 500 bucks a month, or you could have a graduated repayment plan where the, the payments start out low when you're not making as much money, maybe $50 a month, and then they get higher, maybe $700 a month when you're making more money. Or you can have an income driven repayment plan, um, or income based repayment. And essentially is a, they cap what you're. Uh, payment will be to no more than 10% of your discretionary income. Now, discretionary income is money that you have left over after paying off like your bills. And so then whatever you have left over, 10% of that, um, no more than 10% will go to your student loan payment. So, you know, if you have a $50,000 student loan, um, you might only have to make $100 a month payment. Uh, but the thing is, you're never really going to pay it off because... You're not because they have interest, um, usually between three and six percent. But again, there are certain programs. So after 20 years for everyone, so if you make payments for 20 years and it's still not paid off, usually it will be. But if it's still not paid off, your loan will be forgiven. Now, if you work for a government agency, a public service, so federal government, state government, local government, um, you work for 10 years and you make payments. Uh, for 10 years um, and it can be at, at the income based repayment level um, you make payments for 10 years then your loan will be forgiven so that's actually the program that I am in as a teacher um, and so mine are I'm getting close um, even though I've been teaching for more than 10 years it has to be full time and I was uh, only part time for like two years so um, yeah so that's a pretty good deal now if I would have got a private loan I wouldn't have that option and now it's five years if you're a teacher in a low income school. Um, so some, uh, some good options there. Again, this is always subject to change. I would encourage you to obviously, you know, if you can work through college and pay and, and not take out any debt, that's awesome. Or maybe your parents have some money for you. That's awesome. Um, for me, I had uh, financial aid, so I got, I got grants because I was low income. And then I took a little bit out uh, to help pay for, you know, books and stuff like that. All right. So the last two rules I'm not really going to expand on. Um, usually in class we would do like budgeting stuff and we just don't have the ability to do that here. But these are important rules. Um, anyways, so rule number eight, use your spare time. So time when you're, when you're not working on maybe, you know, side gigs or side hustles, improving your skills going back to school and maybe getting your master's or, or other trainings. So use your, use your spare time so you can, you know, further your, your career and make more money. Uh, and then rule number nine is the big budgeting one. Spend less than you earn, obviously. Okay. Spend with a purpose. Uh, don't buy stuff Buy experiences. That's way better. Um, you know, would you rather go on a, a awesome trip or buy, this, I don't know, silly couch, whatever. I don't know. So, um, yeah, those are my, my nine rules. Have those written down, laminate it, hang it somewhere. And then like in four or five years, bust it out. Uh, or even when you turn 18, you start your Roth IRA and start putting, I don't know, 50, $50 a month in it. You will be a millionaire in no time. Guarantee it. All right. See ya.